Hello everyone and welcome back. Last week we talked about early 18th century fashion for the gentleman, inspired by the recent popularity of Our Flag Means Death and Steed Bonnet, who was known as the Gentleman Pirate. So this week we finally get to talk about the pirate. What did pirates wear? And I do promise to be spoiler free until the end of this, just in case you're concerned. The problem here is that we don't actually know much about what pirates wore, or really pirates in general. They liked to be mysterious, they often lived very short lives, and they weren't exactly the type to sit down and have their portraits painted. So how did we end up with such a strong cultural image of what the pirate looks like? We pretty much have Captain Hook and Mr. Smee as our two archetypes of the pirate. How exactly did we get to that point? Well, first off, we have the general history of pirates. Originally written in 1724 by Captain Johnson, it goes into fairly explicit detail about the lives of many of the well-known pirates. However, the thing is, it's written after the deaths of most of them, and Captain Johnson wasn't exactly there for any of that. It's not a first-hand account. It is second-hand. There is a lot of fantasy in the history of pirates. It was written in from the beginning. So the few plates that are in a history of pirates, well, not only can we not verify any level of accuracy to them because the person that drew them never actually saw those people, they're going off of at best descriptions or just making it up in their heads, but depending on the version that you have, because this was reprinted numerous times, you're going to find different images. So the 1724 original version has these images of Blackbeard and Bartholomew Roberts and Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, whereas the 1750s version looks a bit different. Blackbeard has definitely changed a little bit. We're starting to see a bit more um, what we think of the pirate look. And then we have Anne Bonny and Mary Reed who have just, I don't, yeah. But even if we don't have a bunch of pictures and descriptions of what pirates were wearing, the thing is pirates are just privateers without permission slips. They are at their core sailors. Whether they are doing things legally or illegally, whether they are simply trying to be merchants getting stuff across the ocean, or whether they are attacking those merchant ships, they're wearing the same stuff. So it doesn't matter if the sailor is a pirate, a privateer, a merchant, or even in the navy. They've got the same clothing at this time. So that opens us up to a lot more information. Granted, it's still really not all that much when it comes to the early 18th century. I couldn't find a lot. There is a lot more imagery, information, descriptions, even some original garments that survive later on in the century. So that will help inform a lot. Obviously, styles do change as the century progresses, but at their core, even if the cut of the coat is different, they're still going to have the same general purpose. They're still going to be very similar in lots of ways. That being said, there's still not a ton of really easy primary source material on this, so I did have to reference a lot of secondary sources, and even then there is not much that is talking about pirate fashion, or even fashion of sailors in the early 18th century. The vast majority of the things that you're going to find in my description below are going to be talking about sailors' clothing in the late 18th or 19th centuries. All of the stuff listed below is free and accessible, so definitely go take a look at those, dig a little bit deeper. But for now, let's take a look at the primary source material that we do have for what sailors wore. We definitely know that they had a notable style. There are plenty of runaway ads throughout the 18th century of people who were pretending to be sailors or were actually sailors. And the clothing that they wore could be entirely sailor's garb, or they might have on a jacket or a pair of trousers that were sailor specific. But if they were pretending to be a sailor by wearing sailor's clothing, clearly sailors had a look. And caricatures of the era definitely support that. The sailor is a really common stereotype in a lot of satires of the era. They draw them a very specific way. They have a, a range of outfits, but they always come across very clearly as a sailor. So they definitely have a distinct image. On the more realistic or tangible side of things, there are also shipwrecks from the late 18th century that have a lot of preserved pieces to them. So the HMS de Brac and the General Carlton are two very rich examples of what sailors were wearing on board ships 
And this is especially important to compare to those images because what the images, the caricatures are showing are sailors on land, sailors that have come into port. And what they are wearing when they go ashore is not necessarily, and pretty much guaranteed is not, the same as what they are wearing at sea. So in order to know what sailors are wearing at sea, you can look at the even smaller amount of imagery that is drawn of sailors actually working, but we can also look at what survives from the ships because that's what they had with them, even if they aren't regularly illustrated wearing all of those garments. The going ashore clothing, as they called it, is potentially going to be a mix of their working sailors' clothing and the regular land clothing of the era, and they might be doing this on purpose in order to signify I am a sailor, they might also do it because they can't necessarily afford much else. This is one of the places where pirates might differ slightly. The average sailor in this era, especially aboard a merchant ship, is not earning much money. And quite often in the Navy or on merchant ships, their pay is quite deep in arrears. They're not getting it for a very long time, months or even years after they technically earned it. So they don't always have a lot of ready spending money. And that is also one of the reasons why some ships will turn to piracy because they'll get a lot more money right now. So pirates do theoretically, as long as they're successful, have more access to ready cash. And when they are taking another ship, they are no one to steal the clothing off of that ship. It's valuable and it's also beneficial to them right then and there. So they might have access to more high fashion than the average sailor would. So as they get off the ship and walk about town, they might be a little bit more fancified. Wonderful description of Bartholomew Roberts, a well-known pirate, describes him as wearing a rich crimson waistcoat and breeches, a red feather in his hat, a gold chain round his neck with a diamond cross hanging to it, a sword in his hand and two pairs of pistols hanging at the end of a silk sling flung over his shoulders. According to the custom of the pirates. That's a pretty elaborate outfit, to say the least. But on board, they needed work clothing. They needed practical, functional clothing. And that was generally referred to as slops. Slops can also refer to a specific garment that we'll get to later, but in general, all of that sort of clothing was considered slops. And slop sellers were present at least by the early 17th century in a lot of port cities. The garments that they are selling are unfitted, they are cheap, mass-produced, usually out of very durable and utilitarian fabrics. They're not meant for fashion, they're meant for workwear. These are not just for sailors, even though they are heavily associated with them, they also can be generally for anyone doing labor. So you're gonna see the same sort of basic, inexpensive, mass-produced, unsized, unfitted, quickly made clothing for the enslaved population or for the working class, anybody who is doing physical labor is going to be wearing this sort of clothing. There are some garments in it that are more specific to sailors because of the types of work that they were doing, but the general concept of slop clothing and slop sellers would have been marketing to all of these different groups. They might be making it in-house or they might be importing it in large bundles over from Europe. Ships also realized that sometimes sailors would need access to this clothing while at sea. So in 1623, the Royal Navy decided to start putting slop chests on board, and eventually they morphed into being slop rooms, and they would carry a wide variety of different clothing items that would be necessary for working garments for sailors. Now it is important to note that these were not brought on board ships and then handed out freely or issued to the sailors. They were purchased by the sailors. The difference being though that if they were purchased on board, the cost was taken out of the sailors' pay. So they just wouldn't be paid quite as much whenever they did get paid. So they didn't need to have the money in hand versus the slop sellers in town that definitely required ready money. They were not going to operate on credit because they may never see you again. So it was really essential to have that availability even if it still cost them money. The idea of a uniform didn't make its way to the common sailor in the Royal Navy until 1857. There are uniforms in a sense for the upper echelons of the Royal Navy, the captains and the admirals, but it's more like they have a set of guidelines and then they themselves have to go and get a tailor to make them their clothing. And not surprisingly, when it comes to the uniforms or the slops that are being provided in a sense, not everyone can afford them. The Marine Society as of 1756 was actually providing free clothing 
to sailors who could not afford to purchase the set that they needed, which is important to note, even though it's later than our time period, because it gives us a list of what they thought was basic necessities, which is really a full ensemble plus a few extras. So that way you have a change of stockings, a second cap, a second shirt. You have some things that can layer up or be used separately. So this list is important for that reason alone. It kind of shows what was bare minimum for sailors in the 18th century. But not surprisingly, this means that with limited availability of clothing, limited fit of clothing, as things were generally just in vague sizes, and you might not have the availability of the size that you need. And on top of that, this stuff could be kind of expensive, even though it should theoretically be cheap, not everyone could afford it. The clothing that you did have really needed to be taken care of. And there is a ton of evidence for a lot of effort being put into patching and repairing clothing. A lot of the men that were sailors originally had some other trade before they became sailors. Tailors are one of the most common trades, therefore they showed up on most ships' rosters, as well as shoemakers. And in reality, people who knew how to sew as a trade, as a skill, were incredibly common on ships. There are just so many trades that require it, not just tailors and shoemakers, but anyone who does any sort of leather work, people who deal with tent making or sail making, and of course, surgeons they're going to need to know how to stitch. But generally everyone in this time period learned how to sew. It's not a gender thing. It's not just women that learned how to sew. Everyone needed to know how. It was a basic skill and it was especially a necessary skill on board a ship. Sails got damaged and needed repairs, needed replacements while at sea. So people needed to know how to sew in order to take care of the ship. Doesn't mean that they were necessarily good at it and sail making as a trade is different than tailoring. It uses different stitches. And interestingly enough, a lot of the evidence that we have from the shipwrecks and actually from the one set of surviving clothing that we know is sailor's clothing from the 17th century, there's a lot of repairs, a lot hatching and replacing in different fabrics, sometimes fabrics that likely were sailcloth, and the stitching styles vary from fine stitches to really rudimentary and crude stitches to sometimes using methods that are specific to sail making, different seam overlapping methods and that sort of stuff. So you find a wide variety of evidence of them trying to do different types of upkeep with different levels of skill and knowledge. Because above all else, this clothing wasn't for appearance, it was for protection. Sailors needed protection from the wind, the water, the sun, and not to mention the ship itself, covered with all sorts of moving parts, ropes, and wet fabric, and tar, and wood, and just so many things that might absolutely assail them. <laughs> On top of this, they're regularly climbing way up in the mass and just generally doing dangerous things. So their clothing cannot get in the way and it needs to continue to function really well through all of these things. Therefore, they heavily relied on the right type of fibers for this. Woolen and cotton were in large quantities. Wool especially was the most common because it is relatively water resistant. It stays dry to the touch, even when it's pretty wet. It's also great at dealing with heat and cold. It keeps the cold out. It can keep the heat out to some extent as well. And it's just generally very durable. It's long lasting and hard wearing. It is a very sensible fiber to have in your arsenal. And if you immediately thought, oh, wool, that's gotta be so incredibly hot. Remember the fact that Hollywood pretty much just shows us pirates in the Caribbean. They don't really show us the fact that pirates went wherever there were wealthy ships, wherever they had a ship to rob in the world, they went. And that is absolutely everywhere, <laughs> wherever there are large ports. The Caribbean was definitely a hot spot for them, but they went up and down the coast of North America. They went over to Europe, around Africa, into the Indian Ocean. They traveled everywhere. And even in warm tropical climates, when you're out at sea, it can be much colder especially with the wind and the water. And at night, it can be really cold. So they had to protect themselves against a whole host of different types of weather. But for the hotter climates, that's where they relied more on linen and cotton for their overall clothing. Linen was going to be there regardless of the climate because that is the best stuff for up against your skin. That deals with body moisture and odor and all of that stuff more so than anything. That is also why sails are made out of linen canvas and not cotton canvas at this time. It's just better at dealing with moisture and wicking it away. Cotton was also present. 
It just doesn't deal with moisture quite as well because it's meant to rot away with moisture, so linen is definitely preferable, but you will see all three of those fibers being regularly used in all of the clothing on board ships. As for knowing how they dealt with the heat when they did land in the Caribbean islands, we can look to what was being worn in the southern colonies, in North America, or in the Caribbean islands at the time. There's, again, not a lot of reference material for this, but there, there is a limited amount. And one of the great resources for images of this come from Agostino Brunia, who was in Dominica in the 1770s and 1780s, and he was painting a lot of images of daily life. Now, I want to specify that this is a very idealized version of daily life, so don't read too much into the cultural aspects that you're seeing here. It is rose-tinted. It is definitely got an agenda to it. But as for the clothing, which is rendered in amazing detail, we can see a lot of examples of what was being worn by a whole variety of different people to deal with the heat. They definitely adjusted standard European fashions to match the weather. And interestingly enough, a lot of the clothing you'll notice is pretty loosely fitted, something that is already a standard of sailors' clothing. So there's definitely going to be overlap between the two. And when it came to sailors' clothing, a lot of what we're going to see starts off with what we talked about last week, the same base garments, breeches, waistcoat, shirt. It's all going to be very similar, even if it may not be quite as well fitted or out of nearly as expensive of fabrics. The shirts, for example, they do have access and plenty of mentions of them having white linen shirts, but they tend to be more for going ashore. It's for their nicer clothing because on board ships, washing clothing is a lot more difficult, at the very least getting it washed as well as you can on shore, because you can bleach and scrub and hot water, whereas uh, fresh water on board a ship is a lot more limited and definitely not going to be going towards washing your clothing. So even though washing clothing was considered absolutely necessary, there are plenty of naval decrees about how they need to be changing out their linens at least twice a week in order to deal with bare minimum cleanliness, they are choosing instead to go with pattern shirts, checks, stripes, different colors. They particularly like blue, whereas green and brown were also very popular. So they were choosing that because it's not going to show dirt as much, and it's, you know, a way to kind of be a little bit more personalized and creative with your clothing. Waistcoats weren't terribly different than what was on shore, just made out of different textiles. The length was also generally shortened in order to make them a bit more practical, which as the century progresses, the fashionable length also shortens up. So in some ways they're just kind of ahead of the style, but the longer skirts were going to get in the way, which also brings us to what the outer garments they were wearing were. Because we talked about coats last week, jackets are much like coats, they're just simply shorter, they don't have nearly as long of skirts, therefore much more practical for working attire, and you probably would also be losing those giant fashionable cuffs that would definitely get in the way. More fitted sleeves, plain sleeves, possibly a mariner's cuff that buttons down at the forearm so that way the whole thing can be unbuttoned and folded back to get out of the way if you need to have your arms free, but this is simply just a more functional version of a coat in many ways. There are also overcoats, things that are meant to be larger, heavier. There are plenty of references to pea jackets being worn specifically by sailors a lot in those runaway ads, which seems to be a reference at the time to the type of fabric that it was made out of. There are also watch coats, which are incredibly large, oversized, heavy coats meant to deal with inclement weather when you are on watch. Something like a watch coat wasn't necessary for every single sailor to have, but having a few on board meant that whoever was on watch at the time had access to them. They could also do some extra for weatherproofing to their clothing by tarring it. The tar was readily available and being used on the ropes and in all sorts of other applications around the ships. However, it's going to make your clothing heavy, stiff, water resistant from both the outside and the inside, and it's going to crack and break down the fabric a lot faster if it's getting a lot of abrasion and folding. So it's going to shorten the lifespan of the clothing if it's being worn on the regular, and it's gonna be pretty uncomfortable to wear. So tarring clothing is done in limited quantities when weatherproofing is specifically needed. It's not necessarily what they're going to be wearing on a daily basis because it's just really impractical. But all of this brings us to the more obvious pieces of clothing distinct to sailors. On their lower garments, trousers were definitely a popular item. Again, trousers, longer version of breeches, like we're used to seeing the ankle length today for most of our styles, but these were looser fit working garments. They are not fashionable, they are not really worn by the average person in this time unless they are doing physical labor. So sailors definitely really loved loose fit trousers, and they also were very well known for another garment that was termed petticoat breeches or slops, 
or simply breeches that are loose at the knee. And these are sort of a holdover from some 17th century styles that are really oversized in terms of the fullness of the legs, and they are meant to go over a pair of regular breeches. So these are a protective garment that is specifically meant to protect the regular breeches from tar, from the rain, from whatever it is, just all of the, the external things. So those are something that is incredibly distinct about sailors, and you will see that imagery over and over and over again with them wearing those. In terms of accessories, we of course think of first and foremost the tricorn hat, which does exist in this era, and you will find plenty of images of sailors wearing cocked hats, one, two, or three sides cocked up, but you won't find them wearing those while working on board because they are horrendously impractical for being at sea. They won't block the sun on a good portion of your face, they stick out really far at weird places, so you're gonna bump into things and catch it. The wind's also gonna catch it because it's pretty large. And if it rains, you've essentially created a gutter and downspout system to directly pour water into lots of places. So it's just, trust me, a really bad idea to wear that sort of thing at sea. You do find round hats being worn by sailors, particularly later on in the century. They grow in popularity as the century progresses, and they're just simple felted hats with a much shorter brim than the cocked hats, so it'll provide a more even protection from the sun and the rain. But the most common thing that you're going to find mentioned in sailors' inventories or in imagery is, is going to be the knitted cap. The Monmouth cap is a specific style of knitted cap that had been made in Monmouth for quite a while prior to this, and there are many different styles of knitted caps, but a wool knit cap will keep you very warm, it will keep you very dry, it will keep the sun off of your head, it can be pulled down over the ears to keep them warm as you need. So this is just the standard of sailor's attire. It is absolutely everywhere, and they were usually in large quantities in those inventories of what sailors needed in their wardrobes. As for footwear, plain buckled shoes are the thing that you see the most when it comes to surviving pieces out of those shipwrecks, as well as imagery. Boots are not necessarily the most practical thing. A lot of the boots that we see in pirate imagery are actually more akin to riding boots. They're really not going to do well for walking, let alone moving around a ship, climbing the riggings, anything like that not gonna happen in boots. They're also more expensive, even if they are the more functional working boots, such as half boots, laced up styles that are much shorter and a bit easier to work in, they are going to be more expensive. And salt water does a number on leather, and you can't really do much about that. They're going to get destroyed and fall apart a lot faster. So why put more money into something that's not necessarily going to issue you much more protection than a regular pair of shoes? Once you get leather to a certain level of wetness, it, it just everything's wet. Like, you can't prevent that from happening. I did find plenty of secondary resources that said that sailors would also sometimes go barefoot on board ships in the Caribbean, but none of these secondary resources took me back to a primary reference for this. They just kept taking me to other secondary resources. So that might be the case. I just haven't found the evidence that makes me feel like I can support that theory just yet. As for other accessories, the printed kerchief is definitely one of note. It is regularly illustrated as tied about the neck. Yes, there are some references to kerchiefs upon the head. The 1720 trial of Mary Reed and Anne Bonny does reference them as wearing men's jackets and long trousers and handkerchiefs tied about the head. The imagery that we have from that 1724 issue of the History of Pirates shows them with those kerchiefs, and instead of being the way that we tend to see pirates wearing kerchiefs today, where it's kind of low over the forehead and jauntily on top tied in the back, this is likely more worn for more keeping the hair out of the face or for protecting the hair. So there are plenty of examples of kerchiefs being worn in this era as head protection. It's just more likely going to be that type of style than what we usually see in our modern imagery. And last but certainly not least in terms of sailors' accessories, we have the stick. This is something that is mentioned over and over again and shown over and over again as something that sailors took with them when they went ashore. It's not seen being used as a walking stick, it's just a stick. I don't know. <laughs> Can't forget the stick. So with all of this, it still begs the question, how did we go from this to this? 
in honestly what is a pretty short span of time. That's an image from the 1830s. And honestly, I could spend like half an hour pointing out everything wrong here down to the four whole buttons on his sleeves. I, I don't know, there's so much wrong here. And it's not that far off from when the pirates actually existed. How is it this wrong? The thing is that pirates really cultivated in their lifetimes a concept of fantasy and fiction around them. So it's no surprise that the clothing followed suit so quickly. And the images that we're used to seeing, the visuals we have of pirates today, come from a number of sources in the 19th century. We have, of course, Pirates of Penzance from 1879. We have Treasure Island from 1881, 82. And one of the big sources of imagery that we have is Howard Pyle, who wrote a book about pirates in 1887, put a lot of images in there, and his version of pirates is kind of a combination of 19th century Spanish folk wear, vague 18th century menswear, and I would also add 19th century sailors, because it was pretty important for the modern audiences looking at people on stage or these drawings to recognize instantly that these were sailors. So they really relied on what people knew of as sailors from the world around them. So they pulled 19th century sailing clothing and then just kind of piled a whole bunch of interesting stuff on top, whether it was coming from 17th century Dutch, 18th century English and French, or 19th century Spanish. They sort of swooshed the whole thing together into one consistent sailor of ye old times. So it all has some reference points, just not from that specific era or that specific type of person. And this is where we bring back up our flag means death. Obviously, the clothing chosen for this show does not pretend to be historically accurate. The entirety of the show does not pretend to be historically accurate. It's really more like we've got vague history, a lot of caricatures, and from my viewpoint, a lot of wonderful historical Easter eggs. I've really enjoyed doing this research and re-watching the series, finding a whole bunch of reference points that I didn't even recognize before in terms of actual historical events or facts. It's just spend some time doing some research, reading a few books or listening to some podcasts or whatever, and go back and watch it again. It is brilliant to see how much history is just hidden away in there. But I do have to praise them for the fact that they didn't end up with the absolute stereotype of the Mr. Smee pirate for the pirate crew. <laughs> they have more of a 19th century sailor aesthetic to them. Uh, frankly, if this isn't the image that inspired Lucius, I don't know what could be. It just so perfect. So they are referencing something that is a bit more realistic and tangible, even if it's out of its era. They aren't putting people in with peg legs and eye patches. They aren't covering them in the skull and crossbones or giant 17th century bucket boots where they're clomping around and unable to actually function in them. Despite the fact that they are a completely inept crew, they're still wearing fairly functional clothing, and they're really making do with what they have. There's plenty of evidence on their clothing that they are utilizing what's around them to repair it. And even though they do make an argument that most of them don't know how to sew. That's women's work. Oh, black taste, come on now. You know that's not true. With, of course, the exception of a few, including Roach, who stitched up his own shoulder, which again, Surgeons sewing. I mean, it would make sense that pirates need to know how to sew for surgical reasons alone. <laughs> if anything, it just shows that, yes, again, they are absolutely inept because sailing requires you to know how to sew to care for the sails, to make flags, to repair your own clothing. So in some ways, being historically inaccurate makes the characters more accurate. As for Blackbeard's crew, I'm not sure that I would choose to wear all black and leather at sea in the Caribbean or at sea in general, and especially not as I'm getting off of the boat to go onto the Caribbean islands. That just sounds really unpleasant. But again, the weirdness of the accuracy here is that this is very fantasy based. They are really creating a character with this imagery. Blackbeard very much did try to put out a horrifying, menacing image that from records meant that some ships, once they realized it was Blackbeard, just went, never mind, I give up, I'm not putting up a fight. The goal was always to not actually have to fight, it was just to take what you wanted. So having that fantastical image, literally knowing that they were villains and building up a persona and character around it and a visual around it, a lot of the descriptions and imagery that we have of Blackbeard does likely come from Izzy Hans, who is a real person. And he went around basically talking about his time serving under Blackbeard, 
and just absolutely praising all of these things that he did and likely really uh, amplifying the stories that were being told in our visual imagery of what Blackbeard looked like. So that's a perfect example of even in the era when Blackbeard was even still alive, the way that people pictured him may not have been remotely realistic to the way that he looked. And what they put in for the costumes for that is just a really modern version of a villain character. Granted, Blackbeard's costume definitely has a more modern influence, but the thing is they were intentionally putting forward these characters during their lives. And that is why there is so little known about pirates, what they actually looked like, how they actually operated. We have so much written about them. It's just overwhelming the amount of stories and fiction and fantasy that has been written about this group of people that we know so little about. Also, can we just take a few seconds because I absolutely adore this outfit. The, the shirt is from I Do Declare. I made the waistcoat. Um, I'll have some stuff about that in a video in a few weeks. And just, I, 